counting went on. There it goes. one just because people are still coming in. Good afternoon. My name is Judy Halstead from the Health Department. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm very pleased that we've had an opportunity to have Michael with us today and David. I'm going to do quick introductions um, because we are on a pretty tight timeline. They both have both came in and said, well, I get the whole hour, right? Um, and so obviously, since we only have one hour, that's not right. So <laughs> we're going to try and move through fairly quickly. Michael will have the first half hour, and David will have the second. I'm very honored to have Michael here in town with us. Michael has been brought to Lincoln by a number of organizations to be able to share his message. Um, and David Altman, we're happy to have as one of our own in Lincoln. Um, David's from the Assistive, Te Assistive Technology Partnership here in Lincoln. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Michael. Michael is a, an author, um, and he is well-versed in also um, training folks in working in the workplace with individuals with disabilities. He's going to tell us a number of um, his insights and share with us today <coughs> some, also some technology. So um, please join me in welcoming Michael. Thank you. And as long as we're talking about technology, here's my uh, major piece of technology. Come here, come on, come on. Good girl. This is Africa. Africa is a guide dog from, you, you do kisses very well. <laughs> Africa is a guide dog from Guide Dogs for the Blind in San Rafael, California. We have been working together now for about three and a half years. So I was asked to come because it's part of the, the group that of, of events and speeches that we're doing around Lincoln over the next three days. We started at Southeast High School this morning and we are just going all over creation. I challenged the organizers of this to make that happen and they did a decent job of filling up the schedule. <laughs> wasn't, you know, it wasn't too bad anyway. So um, I'd like to introduce you to them. Um, Janet and Gail, would you stand? Janet, Coleman, Gail, Rensi, right? Would you stand up? These two ladies brought this about. Yeah. They're retired educators in the Lincoln school system. So they are tenacious, as, uh, as was said this morning, and there's no doubt about it. You know, teachers, how they are. They can be tenacious. So why am I here? I'm not quite sure. I was told I got three hours this afternoon, so I don't know what Judy's talking about. I'm speaking until somebody holds up a sign in the back of the room that I see that says that my time is up, and until I see the sign, forget you guys. I'm speaking. So why are, why are we here? Well, a lot of what I talk about philosophically comes from the fact that I was born and became blind as a premature child because of being given too much oxygen. But being told by my parents that I could do whatever I chose to do, that no matter what society said about what blind people could and couldn't do, the reality is it was really up to me. Now, that also meant that there were times to ask for help, there were times to ask for assistance, and there were times to draw the line and say, no, I can do this on my own. A lot of the help and assistance does come from technology, and you're gonna hear that message from David later because he's got some things to show you in terms of technological devices that, that people can use. We all use technology. Every one of you uses technology. For purposes of our discussion, it started with Thomas Edison when he invented the electric light bulb so that you sighted light-dependent people could get around in the dark. And everyone thinks that's funny, but just try being in the middle of Penn Station in New York when there's a power failure, and let's see if you can find your train track. The fact of the matter is, the only difference between you and me in that situation is, hopefully I've learned the train station and know where tracks are, but I don't get the luxury of relying on signs. That's what you have. You come into this building because you see a sign that tells you what the building is. 
People think that because I don't know where the building is necessarily, I must be less competent than you. The reality is, I may not know where the building is only because I don't get access to signs like you. That is something technology can fix. Technology cannot fix basic attitudes. Technology cannot fix the basic concept that the handicap of blindness is not blindness, but rather the misconceptions that people have about blindness. Technology can help me drive a car. Technology will help me drive a car. It has been done. I've been telling people for the last couple of days being here, if you get a chance, go to www.blinddriverchallenge.org. You will see Mark Riccobono, a gentleman who is the director of the Jernigan Institute for the Blind, a research center, the largest research center in the country on blindness, and it's run by blind people. That organization is part of the National Federation of the Blind, which challenged private, well, challenged any university and private industry to help develop a car that a blind person can drive. Last year, on January 29th, 2011, Mark Riccobono drove a car independently around the Daytona Speedway right before the Rolex 24 race. No sighted people in the car, no sighted people telling him where to go on a radio, no sighted people helping whatsoever. It was all because of technology that Mark had in the car that had been developed by Virginia Tech University and private industry. Blind people will drive cars. It will be a while yet before it's street legal. Can't come too soon given the way most of the people I watch on the road drive. <laughs> Go off and look at any insurance company. Check their statistics and it'll tell you even today, fewer blind drivers have accidents than sighted drivers. Prove me wrong. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that technology isn't the end all. Technology isn't what really is going to make it possible for me to do whatever I choose to. Only attitude, persistence, <coughs> and my internal vision are gonna bring that about. Technology will help. A guide dog helps. People think that a guide dog is magically able to do whatever I want, that I could go out on a street and just tell Africa down here, go find me the public city and county employees building, and the dog is magically going to know how to do it. Or go find the council chamber, and the dog's going to know that. It doesn't work that way. The dog's job is to make sure that I walk in a straight line until I can't anymore or to make sure that we walk safely so that if there's an obstacle in my way to go around the obstacle or to go until I say to turn, but it's my job to know when to turn. I know that <clears throat> in a variety of ways, such as asking questions, uh, possibly using a talking GPS system and so on, using technology the way you do. But I don't think that there is anyone in this room that would think that without technology, people who have eyesight couldn't survive because we know what willpower is. It's magically amazing to me that people think that blind people have to have technology in order to function, but even then they can't function as well as people who can see, because all of you think that sight is the only game in town, and that's just not true. We all have gifts. We have gifts that we can use that will help us. We have gifts some time of patience, which will allow us to ask other people for assistance. And I believe very fervently that teamwork is extremely important no matter what we do. That in fact, in reality, no one has ever accomplished anything on this earth without somewhere having the assistance of somewhere else, someone else. Let me repeat that. No one has ever accomplished anything on this earth without somewhere having the assistance of someone else. That's just a fact, whether it was a teacher who taught you something, whether it was something that you saw that gave you an idea, whether it was Einstein using students and others to help with some of the mathematics and proving the mathematical concepts, or all the people who came before him who built up the level of theories of quantum mechanics and physics that allowed him to get to the point of discovering or creating the theory of relativity, both general and special. There too. Go look it up. The fact of the matter is, I have a master's degree in physics, so I, I'm a little bit aware of some of that. The fact of the matter is, though, that it isn't all technology. But the technology helps. But don't get sidelined by the technology that you see that I and David will show you today. Don't get sidelined by that. Because no matter what the technology, no matter how good of a job we do, 
The reality today is that the unemployment rate among employable blind people in this country is 70 plus percent. Seven zero. Do you think I really get excited when I hear that the overall national unemployment rate is 8.7 when I'm sitting here looking at how many blind people are unemployed, knowing that it's not because blind people can't do the job, but rather knowing that it's because people who are making the decisions about who gets hired don't think blind people can do the job simply because they can't see. That is the barrier that we have to overcome as a society. It isn't diversity, it's inclusion. We have to decide that we're gonna truly be an inclusive society and that we accept people as they are and we give people all the opportunities that they can have to do what they can do. That we give proper education to people like teaching blind children braille. Blindness being not a total lack of eyesight, but rather a sufficient limitation of eyesight so that you can't use your eyes to do the same things that you would do if you had full 2020 eyesight. You notice that I don't use words like 2020 vision because I think that vision is a whole different thing on a campaign to change our, our definition of vision, not to having to do with eyesight, but having to do with foresight and just insight. And I think that's where vision comes from. And so, I am perfectly happy talking about <clears throat> the fact that my eyesight might not be as good as the next body, but my vision is as good as any. Which is why in our book, Thunderdog, which um, we can talk about purchasing in a minute, Thunderdog <laughs> says in part, don't let your sight get in the way of your vision. If you wanna purchase it, we're doing a major speech at the Cornhusker Hotel tomorrow night. We'll have plenty of books to sell there. We didn't bring any today because I didn't know whether the the city and county would let us sell and stuff like that. So just to not make life difficult, come tomorrow to the Cornhusker at seven o'clock. It's free, love to have you, and we'll go into more detail about a lot of this stuff. You know, talking about technology and so on, no matter what, I think it's helpful to show you some of the devices that I use. Africa, you gotta wake up, I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, my first job out of college was working for the National Federation of the Blind because a guy came along to the Federation, to the president and said, I've got this neat machine. He came back in 1974, his name was Raymond Kurzweil and he said, you know, I've got a machine that consists of this big flatbed scanner and I can put a piece of paper down on there with whatever you've got on it other than handwriting. My machine will take an image of that paper and read it out loud. Now, what made that unique from a standpoint of the world is that it didn't care what type font or set of type fonts was on the page. Optical character recognition to that point was a single font as opposed to an omni font operation. The only way there might be a possibility of doing multiple fonts on the same page was if you had a huge mainframe computer to allow you to do the character recognition processing. But Ray Kurzweil came along with a much smaller computer. His only weighed about 150 pounds. It was a Data General Nova 2 mini computer. Um, and, and his scanner and so on um, were all together in this neat little package. It only was about uh, the size of a, well, how can I say it, apartment washing machine. You know, So it only weighed about 400 pounds, cost $50,000. But you know, it read any set of type fonts. And so he told that to all to the National Federation of the Blind President. The president sent some people up who were very pessimistic and skeptical about it because we're always hearing about all these neat things that people are gonna do to help blind people survive. And um, lo and behold, it worked. I talk about people are always coming along with technology that blind people can use. Most blind people, when they walk, use a cane. A white cane is the most basic travel tool that we have, just like a pencil is the most basic tool or pen that you have for reading and writing. So when I walk with a cane, the, the standard way to do it is if I step forward with my right foot, I move the cane to my left, and then when I step forward with my, um, with my right foot, I move it to my left. When I step forward with my left foot, I arc it to my right, touching the ground, and I keep going, and I can find obstacles and travel very well. Because the reality is, as I said, it isn't what the dog or the cane does, it's what I know. Anyway, somebody came to the Federation one day and said, we got this great advancement on your cane. It's a cane, but it's got this little detector in it, and it talks to you, and when you come up to a step, 
and, and the step goes down, it'll say step down. I couldn't find that out with the cane, but it had this thing that said step down, or if you came to a curb going up, it would say step up. Well, you know, life is fun. The people didn't think that we could do that, so somebody actually showed them the fallacy of that. They said, let me show you the problem with it. He walked over to a window, opened the window, and stuck the cane out the window, and the cane said step down. You know, and he was on the seventh story of a building. The reality is that technology has to be sensible. Well, this Kurzweil reading machine seemed like a neat thing. Well, lo and behold, um, we helped in the development of it. My job was to travel around the country, literally, with a toolbox and a couple of suitcases for 18 months, setting up machines so that blind people could test them. We had prototype machines so that we could help develop what would be the final first generation model of the machine. That was back in 1976. In 2001, Ray began working on the latest version of it because he always wanted to have a machine that would read out loud but that would be portable. And sure enough, in 2008, the KNFB Reader Mobile was born. A device that literally is a cell phone, it uses a Nokia cell phone. If I could hold this up, I'd be in great shape. A Nokia cell phone, hold it right side up would be good too. And with this device, with a special program that's built into it, I can take a picture of a printed page and actually read it out loud. I'm just gonna quickly show it to you um, as one of the things that I can do. And it may be a little hard to hear, but I'll put the mic up to it. But I'm putting the, the reader down in the middle of a page. I'm telling it that I want to go into the mode which captures an image. I'm lifting it up above the page. I'm pushing a button. Taking a picture. And it takes a picture of the page. Very processing picture in books, articles, and labels format. Let's see what it does. By Camera the way. Camera is five degrees clockwise relative to the page. Text cut off on bottom and right. Maybe. E case with many Americans. Michael H slash sound life. Shang T A Tonnet slash circus slash slash Y. I hold it up too high. Slash two hundred. He and his guide dog Rosa were the lucky ones, however. And that they escaped the World Trade Center attack. As a WTC survivor and as a guide dog user, he was thrust slash the international... You get the idea? I'm able to sit there and read that page. I can read my mail. I can go into a restaurant and read the menu. Unfortunately for me, the bottom downside to that is I can also read the bill at the end of the meal. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that technology gives me an ability to read that was never available to me so that I have more access to print. Does that mean I shouldn't read Braille? No more than having television means you don't teach sighted kids how to read print. Because Braille is the only means of reading and writing that is truly available to me. So there are now Braille printers that make production of Braille a lot less expensive. There are also devices such as this called a Braille note which provides a non-permanent braille display that allow me to take notes or take any kind of electronic text, load it into the memory of the braille note, and actually sit here and read the braille display. Right now, I'm using this as um, a timer so that I know when my time is actually up so that I don't give, you any, any, give anybody the embarrassment of holding up that sign in the back of the room and not seeing it. So right now I know I've been speaking for 16 minutes and 41, 42, 43, 44 seconds. So I know that my three hours is still got a ways to go. But again, it is a device that gives me the opportunity to have access to information it's very expensive. The KNFB Reader Mobile that I showed you costs $1,800. The Braille Note, the device I just showed you, costs about $5,000. Very expensive devices. So I took my little speaker and I plugged it into another device. This is called a Victor Reader Stream. The Victor Reader Stream is like an MP3 player, except it's got some other magical little things that I can do with it. So I'm going to turn it on, in theory. Is it working? No, I haven't held it down long enough.
But um, we're going to see, we're going to try to make it work anyway. All of a sudden, it's rebelling. And the battery isn't run down, so who knows. But I'm able to, with this device, actually play any MP3 file. I can um, use it to um, speed up the file without changing the pitch. I can do all sorts of things with it that allow me to, again, have access to reading printed material um, that in this case is in electronic form. So I can read Microsoft Word docs with it. I can do a variety of things. And for some reason, this isn't coming on. I wonder if my machine has just died, which means I'm going to be very bored while flying back to California, if that's the case. But the, but the fact of the matter is, um, those are all devices that are available. The one downside, the Victor Reader Stream is a pretty inexpensive device. It's only about $350 when it's working. The last one I want to show you, just again to put things in perspective, is the iPhone. So this is, except it's got a little battery that I am using to keep things charged. The iPhone here, stop. The iPhone is a standard iPhone right off the shelf that you can go buy in a store. If you go buy an iPhone, if you have an iPhone, go into the settings and go into general and then if you nose around, you'll see an area that's called accessibility. In the accessibility section of the iPhone, you will see that there is a way that you can turn on a voice so that you can actually hear everything that the iPhone is doing. Apple is the only company that has thus far built accessibility into their products. There is no extra charge for having that available. I can buy software to make my computer talk. I'll come back to the iPhone, but I can buy software to make my computer talk, a standard desktop or laptop computer or a netbook or any of those kinds of machines, Windows machines and so on. That software costs $1,000. It's very expensive. Sometimes the state can assist in paying for technology if it's helping someone get a job, but you know there are a lot more people out there than just those who are looking to get a job who need the technology and they need it for more than on the work experience and access they needed at home to read mail like the KNFB reader. Again, going back to the iPhone, the iPhone is the only device that comes the way it does with full accessibility, but that's because Apple was about to be sued and Apple um, recognized that they would lose a lawsuit because they hadn't been making the iPhones, the iPod Touch, or even iTunes and iTunes University websites that could easily be made accessible, they weren't doing anything to make any of that accessible. They had watched as Target, the department store, was sued because Target wouldn't make their website accessible, thus allowing blind people and dyslexic people and other people with so-called print disabilities to be able to have access to their websites to shop. They were missing a big market, but they didn't care, and they basically told people to go pound sand. Well, they were sued, and in reality what happened when the lawsuit went forward was that every time they filed an objection saying, well, we shouldn't be sued under the Americans with Disabilities Act because the Americans with Disabilities Act is all about brick and mortar facilities and has nothing to do with the website because after all the ADA came around long before the internet. Well, the judge looked at that whole thing and he listened to arguments from the National Federation of the Blind who brought the lawsuit saying, well, of course the ADA has full access. It was involving any kind of discrimination and any kind of lack of access. So the judge listened to both sides and the judge went away and he came back and he says, you know, I've listened to both sides, I went away, I came back, Target, you're all screwed up, you're wrong, go make your website accessible. Well, it was a class action lawsuit, so Target said, well, you know, the blind can't be a class by themselves, so we challenge that. Well, the judge listened to that and the judge listened to the National Federation of the Blind Lawyers, who happened to be blind, by the way, who came along and they said, well, if, yeah, not all of them were blind. There was a, there's a guy named Dan Goldstein who is one of the best civil rights lawyers I know. He happens to be a sighted guy. You know, some of our best friends are sighted. But Dan, uh, Dan and a team of blind lawyers really worked on this case. And they came along and they said, well, of course the blind can be a class. What do you mean? There are 1.8 million people in this country who happen to be blind. And when there's discrimination against a person who happens to be blind, isn't that discriminating against a group or a class of people just like any other class in the world? And Target said, oh, that just doesn't make sense. Well, the judge went away and he came back and he said to Target, he said, well, I've considered the decision. You're all screwed up. You've got to fix this. A number of hearings like that, after which Target finally decided to talk settlement. Now, if they had just fixed the website in the beginning, since it's all code, right, it would have cost about $30,000, $40,000 in man hours. When the lawsuit was settled, it cost them $8 million in compensatory damages. Apple saw that. 
And they did the smart thing. They made the device accessible out of the box. They're the only ones, absolutely the only ones to ever do that. It's still got limitations because they don't mandate that apps have some level of accessibility. So the mindset isn't really there yet. You see, I think inclusion, or in our case here, accessibility is a mindset. And we don't truly have the mindset in our country that says that we need to, by definition, make things accessible for people who might not read print, just as we make light bulbs for the rest of society, or we make large screens so that people can watch football on TV, or whatever it is. When technology experts, when manufacturers recognize they're missing out on a large market, when they start to recognize that there are more and more seniors who need access to some of these technologies so that they can enjoy the life they had <clears throat> when they had eyesight, because more and more people are becoming blind as they grow older. When people accept this and recognize it's good business to fix it, when our governments recognize it is important that we truly provide access to all, that we truly create an inclusive society, then and only then will we start to see more companies take the road of Apple and say, we're gonna make our stuff accessible right out of the box because you know, it doesn't cost much to do it if you make that happen during the design phase. Cardtronics is a company that makes most of the credit card processing machines for 7-Elevens and other stores. Millions of machines around the country. They were sued because they did not make their machines accessible. Their point of sale machine so that I could go into a 7-Eleven and punch in the keys and, and hear the information that I need. You know it would cost less than a dollar to put the technology in, even today in retrofitting it, the technology would cost less than a dollar to make the machines talk or to put a keypad in. And now, Cardtronics is going to have to spend many millions of dollars because they lost the suit, they had to settle that one too. It doesn't cost much to make most technology accessible and it costs a lot less if you do it up front in the design phase, but it's all a mindset and that's the thing that we really have to address in this country. It goes beyond technology. I should have the same kind of access to most every service and benefit that the rest of society has. But we just don't consider it and we don't make it happen. And hopefully people like you listening to this will think about that a little bit and maybe over time we can truly make some change. And that's really what it's all about. I have, according to my Braille note, a whole Five minutes, four minutes and 50, and, um, 42 seconds. So I like to open it up for questions. Just don't raise your hands because I don't do hands. But if you have any questions, want to ask anything, there's no question off limits. I'd love to answer any questions in the time we have left. Don't be shy. There is no question that's off limits. Is there a specific website you would refer us to to look at the listing of technology for further review? Or? I don't think that there is a particular website. You can go to the 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 National Federation of the Blind, there is a blog that they have that discusses a lot of technology. It's probably the most unbiased because it's not, tech, it's not a blog run by any of the manufacturers. You can also call the, um, the National Material Center of, not the Material Center, but the in Independent Blind and Technology Center of the National Federation of the Blind in Baltimore, Maryland. They have at least one of every single piece of technology that's available to blind people in the world today, from the smallest little tiny Braille watch to a $70 million printing press that produces Braille. Um, their phone number is 410-659-9314, but you can also go to www.nfb.org and that's also a good springboard to getting to other websites that can give you information about technology. I also have cards and you're welcome to call me. I'm always glad to answer any questions uh, and help any way that I can. So I'm, I'm not, the only, the only technology that I personally promote is I do sell the KNFB Reader. We're the master distributor for it. And we were asked to do that um, by Kurzweil and the National Federation of the Blind. But it's, it's, uh, it's the leading device of its kind now. There are competitors to it that also have pluses and minuses. But by and large, I'm only showing you the technology I use 
um, and I use it for specific reasons, but it's not necessarily the best technology depending on what people need. So I'm glad to advise people on what kind of technologies uh, they might need in individual situations. And I will give you my card, but just to say it, because I know we're recording this, my phone number is 415-827-4084, 415-827-4084, or www.michaelhingson, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I-N-G-S-O-N, Dot com. Next question. Oh, come on. Don't be shy. Can you tell me what's actively being done to address the unemployment rate for the um, You know, one of the most ironic things in this world is that there is a part of the Fair Labor Standards Act, I use fair in loose quotations, that allows organizations and companies to actually apply to, a pay, to pay blind and disabled persons less than minimum wage if the company feels that blind people can't perform at the same level as others. And so there is an active effort now to repeal that. Uh, there is, a, f uh, there is um, a bill that is going into Congress. Originally it was to work with manufacturers to make all technology accessible. Now it's starting out by working with home appliances. Um, there are laws on the books like the Americans with Disabilities Act that talk about providing reasonable accommodations for employment and so on. But you know, the, the level of compensatory damage to deal with some of the, the discrimination issues is a little bit weak in the law. So it's kind of ongoing um, efforts to change some of it. Unfortunately, our political system in Washington, especially in Congress right now, in the House, um, they don't really care. <clears throat> I, I spoke to a congressman earlier this year about the whole minimum wage thing <clears throat> and said, we want you to co-sponsor the bill to repeal this thing that says that blind people can be paid less than minimum wage if a company wants to apply for an exemption. And the congressman said, well, I'm not gonna support that because I don't really support the idea of there being such a thing as minimum wage, and so I can't support a bill that you're calling for repealing um, a piece of the law that would allow blind people to have minimum wage. Never mind that the rest of the country has minimum wage available to it. Blind people don't. That's discrimination. <clears throat> the law, this particular congressman could care less about the discriminatory aspects of the law. He wasn't in favor of minimum wage and he was gonna take that out on blind people. And that's the best way I can describe it. I see that attitude time and time again. So we're fighting a, a, an uphill battle, but it, we're making progress. Next question. Where are you from? I now live in the San Francisco area I travel around the country because, as you may be aware, I worked in the World Trade Center and escaped on 9-11. I was the Mid-Atlantic Region Sales Manager for a computer company. We were on the 78th floor and got out. And that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow at the Cornhusker Hotel, telling that story, talking a little bit more about blindness and so on. And selling books, Thunderdog. The, the, title, of the, book, the title of the book is called Thunderdog. And, uh, and we'll have plenty of books there. Barnes & Noble here in Lincoln is helping us to, uh, to provide the books to sell. When it was published last year, it went right to the New York Times bestseller list. It was on there a number of weeks. It keeps going on and off every so often. It's not a 9-11 book. It goes into a lot more detail. And it, by the way, also has a partial listing of places to learn about technology. Well, time is up. I know David wants to talk, and we believe in sticking mostly to the schedule. So I want to thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure having a chance to talk to you. We're going to be around afterward if anyone has any time, and I'd be glad to answer any other questions. So thanks very much. Come on, the old mic switch now. <laughs> No, I really don't want to introduce myself. <laughs> on, Let's see.
Hi. <laughs> My name is David Altman. Um, I was just thinking a little bit, uh, the two most uh, things that make people nervous are speaking in front of a crowd and paying taxes. <laughs> and um, I'm not a real seasoned presenter like uh, Mr. Hingston, but I'll, I'll try. Um, I've been uh, working with people with disabilities, I think, ever since I was real little. Uh, this is what I've always wanted to do. It's, I know it sounds maybe kind of funny, but um, um, since I was five years old, I used to go out. Um, I had uh, pretty severe asthma, but not, not too bad. Uh, we used to go out with my mom and raise money for children with, with really severe asthma that uh, if they had an attack, uh, they, they uh, died. And um, she was the president of an organization in, in, um, in Colorado, the National Research uh, Children's Hospital. And so I think I got um, sort of introduced to working with people with disabilities and I um, have done just about every aspect working in the field to uh, direct care to, uh, uh, I've been on 10 humanitarian uh, trips to help individuals with disabilities in, in various countries, delivering wheelchairs. Uh, not, not part of my job here, but uh, just as a volunteer effort to deliver medical care and, and wheelchairs to various countries. And um, uh, it's, it's really opened my eyes uh, that, um, you know, every day I wake up, um, I say thank you. You know, and I say thank you for allowing me to um, see my family, uh, to be able to help people uh, another day, because uh, you just never know. You never know, as Michael may tell you tomorrow, you may never know what's going to happen in your life. And so every day I get to work with a population that reminds me of um, how thankful I, uh, I am. And so. I, uh, this project I work for, uh, Assistive Technology Partnership, I've been with it um, uh, almost 23 years. I uh, moved from Kansas City to Nebraska. I had uh, never been to Nebraska before. I had no intentions to moving to Nebraska or even staying here. <laughs> but I did. I fell in love with this project. And um, I can honestly say I, I really uh, love my job most days. <laughs> no, I really do. And so I get to work with people with disabilities uh, and helping them um, find solutions in their daily life, whether it's at the workplace, uh, whether it's uh, any kind of activities of daily living, uh, using uh, any kind of hygiene, anything uh, an individual does every day. I try to go out and, and assess the situation um, and find a solution. And what's really unique about our project is that we, we pay for a lot of uh, technology through various funding streams. So it was developed, um, it was a grassroots grant in 1989 to be a centralized place where people can call uh, for, for any kind of information on technology uh, any kind of information on, on funding that technology it was just a central source for anybody, uh, a place for people to call. And let's see, here, here are the, well, six things. I had to add an extra finger there to cover everything. But uh, I just, there's about six things I wanted to talk about today. Get up and get ready for work. Uh, get to work, uh, at work, uh, AT for all demo center and fee for service. Let's see, I won't switch slides yet. Uh, well, maybe I will. <laughs> I wanted to show you a video of, of <clears throat> I think of technology in a different way. Um, how many here have a cell phone? Raise your hand. Don't be embarrassed now, how many? Everybody? I, I don't have a cell phone. <laughs> I told Ju Judy, said, what's your cell phone number? I said, I don't have one. <laughs> but, and, and uh, you picture a pic uh, guy like me or, you know, doing what I do would have a cell phone and all the latest technology. I, I rode my bicycle here. I don't have a cell phone. 
you know, I, but I, it's my choice. And uh, I love technology. And I think of it in a different way other than, oh, it's a new gadget. I think of it in a um, uh, healing way. Technology is very healing. And when you see um, an individual, a young man, uh, scraping his tush on the ground, trying to move his body across to get someplace, and, and how a wheelchair can change that individual's life, um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty um, eye-opening. Uh, and, and, and so I look at it as, as that, that's a real healing uh, device that, that uh, uh, it's a whole different concept than just saying, oh yeah, it's a new car, new piece of computer, but it, it really helps an individual do something they weren't able to do before. And this one uh, young man that I helped, this had all kinds of decubit eye ulcers on his rear from doing that. So I helped, um, I know quite a bit about wound care, so I helped him heal that and gave him some uh, um, fresh undergarments and treated his wounds, gave him some medicine, and, and we gave him a wheelchair and it changed his life. So I wanted to show you a video of uh, somebody in Omaha that I helped. Um, this um, uh, woman, uh, Valerie Mackins, and she's given me permission to talk about her. And I go see her from time to time when I'm in Omaha, just visit her, stop and visit her. Um, and she always tells me how blessed she is. Every time I go see her, I'm so blessed, I'm so blessed. And she was, um, I think she's about 60 years old. Uh, she has quadriplegia. And um, she was shot in the neck uh, in Omaha by a drive-by shooter uh, when she was just 21 years old. Um, 2001, Valerie requested a phone for communication emergency purposes. She had many doctor's appointments throughout each month. It was critical for Valerie to have a safe and independent way to communicate with her doctors as well as just trying to make a phone call by herself without calling her daughter in to make it for her or to, or to independently answer the phone. So I wanted to show you this video. It's about three minutes and, oh, 47 seconds. Ah. essential to my independence. If someone's not here, my daughter's out or she has to go out. And my granddaughter, who is a senior, isn't here because of extracurricular activities she has at school, then I'm here alone. If something happens, I can't contact somebody or anything if I don't have my phone. My phone is really, really important to me being independent to a certain extent. And even in my social life, you know, in my dealing with other people, people call me all the time where I'm able to be a help and a blessing to them, which makes me feel useful and productive in spite of my physical limitations. So my phone means this is my baby and it means so much to me because not only does it help my independence, it's like an extended arm outside these four walls. And <coughs> I'm just thankful, uh, really, really, ever since I've had this phone, well this is my second one, but ever since I've been able to use a phone like I want to use it, when I want to use it, and not Will you come here? Can you dial a number for me? And then I, somebody tell me, well, I'm doing this right now. You got to wait a few minutes. I don't have to wait. I don't. When I want to make a call, I make a call. If someone calls and maybe Lily's outside emptying the trash, no one's in here to answer the phone, I can answer the phone. So it's a big part of who I am right now and what I'm about and I'm just so thankful and I'm so grateful that I have this phone and I have people who are willing to keep it functioning correctly and 
You got something you want to say, no, Um, I really like this phone and um, how it um, operates and everything because um, a lot of times I'm doing things, um, like she says, and sometimes it's hard to get to a phone or, you know, uh, I may I may miss a call and she's able to answer the phone. Um, I do a lot of running around getting things that, you know, we need and sometimes she sends me out to get, you know, medical supplies, anything, you know, that she needs and I'm glad because for a long time it was very hard for me to just go and leave her not knowing that if something were to happen, you know, she can't get a phone or you know, no one's around. So this phone has really been a great help to me as well. And I'm glad that, you know, we have people, uh, we've been blessed with David. Um, yes. Because from the yes. first time I met him and really, we let him know all that, what we needed and how we needed it to uh, be done. And he did it, he took his time, he did an excellent job. Yes. And ever since um, she's had this phone, it's, it's just been smooth sailing. So pretty powerful, huh? Pretty powerful um, technology. She blows a puff of air into that switch, that little um, accordion-like uh, switch, and she just blows a puff of air, and it it starts to it, it turns on the phone, and it starts to scan very slowly. You can set the scan rate to all the du not numbers that are programmed into the phone. And then she blows another puff of air, and it dials the phone for her. And it, uh, it changed her life. You know, I, I used a phone that was commercially available. I had to uh, develop a mounting system and, and just kind of come up with the idea. And I machined some, a few parts here and there to just hold the system in place uh, for her. Um, but it's, it, it just was incredible how it's changed her life in, the, in 10 years, 10 years. And um, you know, the, the title of this, of this presentation, right, is supporting individuals with disabilities in the workplace. But it's, it's not just the workplace. You know, people have to get up, they have to get ready, they have to be transported somehow to the work. So there's all these things that, you know, if we really think about this, there's such a process. Uh, we got up this morning and I don't know, the alarm didn't go off and, and so my wife and I were kind of scrambling this morning because we had to get our, our young boy to, to school. and. Um, so we changed our routine a little bit. But, you know, we take it for granted what we can do. We can get up and get ready in, in 10 or 15 minutes if we have to. But person that has quadriplegia, it takes a lot longer. And if you, if you really think about that process, I'm going to kind of go through. Um, Michael said it very poignantly that, that we're all interdependent on on each other and that's so true and we have a um, we have a beehive in our backyard there's about um, oh 70,000 bees and uh, it took me a long time to count each one of them <laughs> but I it, it but I counted them and um, you know after work I go home I see the beehive uh, and and so I get to talk with the birds and the bees and they give me advice about life <laughs> but looking at this beehive is is just a um, it's just phenomenal you know there's 70,000 bees in this small little community that work together and if they don't work together the queen knocks them out but uh, you know the queen's the matriarch of the whole hive and uh, you know there's all kinds of different bees there's a there's worker bees that go out and get the pollen, bring back nectar. There's guard bees that guard from intruders from other hives and, and drones. And, and there's just, it's just an incredible community. They're all interdependent on each other to live and to function, to produce, to produce this uh, uh, nectar that we you know, as, know as honey or bee pollen or uh, you know, I'm a very amateur beekeeper, but um, I'm just amazed at, at something like this. So um, 
you know, so we're all interdependent on each other to, to live. Do you, have you seen this movie, Get Up? <laughs> this is uh, Will Ferrell and his dog Baxter. Uh, but this is just kind of a reminder to, to how people get up in the morning. So um, here's a device that um, is used, uh, I used with an uh, individual I worked with, uh, had a head injury. Um, and he uh, missed a phone call. Uh, he was an IT support guy, and he missed a phone call, very important client, almost got fired. Um, the, the employer was very um, accommodating. They, they uh, Voc Rehab had toured their uh, place of employment. They remembered Voc Rehab. They called Voc Rehab for assistance. Is there anything that they can do? Uh, vocational rehabilitation asked ATP, is there anything available? And we assessed the situation right away and I came up with this device that you see on the, on the screen. But it's, uh, it's called uh, Serene and it's a assistive sig signaling device that you put your cell phone on, on the back and it will, um, it will uh, detect the vibration or the, the, uh, the ring of the cell phone. And so he was on a trip when he missed this phone call. So this is very portable. And what it does is when the phone rings, it will send a signal to this bed vibrator, this bed shaker, and it shakes the bed actually. It shakes it or the pillow and it makes you wake up. And so this, this small little device, $50 or $100, it saved his job. So it's again, pretty powerful. So getting up, getting ready. So first thing you have to get up, right? So second thing, getting ready. You know, this is a walk-in shower. Um, uh, individuals that use wheelchairs or shower chair. We just went blank. There we go. Um, have to get ready. And so uh, a, a zero entry shower where someone can roll in take a shower, transfer onto a shower seat, and use maybe a handheld shower. Uh, so, you know, you think about this. This is, this is all of what somebody has to do that, to, to get ready to go to work. Um, exiting the home. Individual uses a wheelchair, um, can't go down the stairs. They use a, what's called a vertical platform lift. Uh, they're about five or $6,000. So this is how they exit the home possibly, or use a ramp, or they can ambulate downstairs if they're able to do that. Um, getting to work. Um, this individual, Sidon, uh, this is a video I'd like to show you, but uh, he fell off a ladder and uh, broke his uh, spine and um, uh, had a high, pretty high spinal cord injury and high level spinal cord injury. And so this is how he has to get to work. He has to transfer into a modified van. And um, just real quick, I'd like to show you a video of him in the, in the workplace. Today. I have some pants I need. All right. This is the fitting room. Why don't you help yourself? Okay. Let me know when you're ready. Okay. Okay. My name is Saido. Oh, I know how to sew when I was 11. And uh, when I came over this country, I do uh, a lot of different kind of job, but finally, I think sewing is my passion. So I decided to go back to work, and from go back to work to open the shop is a long way, but I made it. The accident happened, I'm so sorry to say that, it almost five, over five years ago, and happened on my birthday. I'm so sad, it's still emotion a little bit, uh, emotional a little bit. Uh, I climb up the ladder to fix the girder, and when I go down, and this is not the first time. This is, you can call hundred times. Go up and down on the ladder, no problem. And this time it's ladder flipped. And when the ladder flipped, it hit uh, the back of my uh, 
of my back hit the rail of the deck, so it broke the T4, T5. And in five seconds, I don't know how many times my body rolled it, but when I land on the ground, I could not move my leg. So I know this is no fun. This is not bruise and cut or sprain or uh, something you can easily overcome in a couple of days or whatever. It's a long journey, long painful journey. And I like to say that I don't want anybody to go through what I go through. Okay. Uh, first, I, I uh, know Nancy through uh, the guy named Bob. He is who uh, installed the chairlift for my uh, uh, for my house. You know, the chairlift can help you go from the first floor to the second floor. And during the conversation. He said, I know the lady named Nancy, she have a, she know the special sewing machine can help you. And I say, I raised my mind, I say, how she, she have a special machine for the uh, handicapped people. I know, but I just have that in my mind. And one day I decided to contact her to see how she have a special machine. And I call her, Nancy showed up. Of course, Nancy doesn't know the sewing machine, it's a special machine. But she says she have a resource to help me. Well, it was a, it was a longer process. We started initially with um, exploring and developing a solution with the sewing machines. And initially, Cy worked from home, uh, part-time. It was a journey. Um, when I first met Cy, he wasn't ready to drive or really necessarily ready even to go outside of the home too much. At that point, really struggling to manage pain and adjust to the disability. So it was a journey. Well, his primary task, of course, is the sewing. And unless we could find a solution to modify the sewing machines, he wasn't really going to be able to return to work. Um, so that's why we started with that. And it did allow him to return to work gradually as he was able to tolerate more and more work hours um, and build his tolerance um, for being up and in the chair. <clears throat> so when I have a machine, it's not the machine, but I start to see how my body can endure uh, for go back working. So I start to work one hour a day. And then lately I increase to two hours a day to three hours a day, four hours a day, until I can have enough strain, I decide to go back to work eight hours a day and six days a week. And, uh, but uh, I met Desiree uh, several times, and uh, through her help, you know, I got this, I bought, and I think everything I wished for, I got it. Um, I, I came here, well, I interviewed Cy first at home, and he gave me a list of all of the duties that he would need to be able to accomplish. I work hard. I'm the hardest worker in <laughs> Omaha. I work six days a week. I, sorry, I vacuum the floor, clean the bathroom, <laughs> do the sewing, deliver clothing, taking care of customer, all the stuff, answering the phone all by myself. And I love it. <laughs> so the accident, it it cut me back to 50%. I cannot do like I used to do. And then I came to the work site and just kind of looked around and to see um, clearly there's things that are up in the on the ceiling that he needed to be able to reach. Um, he needs to be able to take measurements in different places um, where the customers are and they stand on a um, kind of a platform and um, and then he also you know once the machines were moved here we needed to figure that out he does steaming there's so many different aspects to it so I just kind of look through um, what did he do what did the place look like and then Cy met me here and he walked me through all of the different duties that he was going to need to be able to do um, and based on those things, we came up with the idea that perhaps the iBot might be helpful.
because of the way that it functions and, and that it would potentially allow him to do every uh, job, every job duty in the business. Um, we looked at different types of chairs that also raise up and down and have different types of functions and everything. Um, but this particular chair met every single one of the, the job duties that he was going to be able to, he would be able to do independently with the chair. So um, that's how we ended up deciding on the iBot. And we, you know, sometimes we have a little joke, half joke, but half uh, sad. Yes, if my case, like in my country, Vietnam, I can become a bad guy, seriously. Because there is no system over there to help for people who disabled like me. I become a bad girl. But here, look at it. I become an owner of the company, of the shop, and I can, I pay tax. I don't receive social security anymore. So I become a normal, like an every citizen. And I believe I'm a productive member of the society. I don't feel like I'm a useless, useless person. That's a wonderful thing. And I use, I, this one I can use the elbow or can use my hand, so I use the elbow. And the funny thing about this, since, since I use the elbow a lot, and some of my friends who work here with me, they start to use the elbow too. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's funny. That's funny. You see that? Mm -hmm. I can use both hands. I can use both hands like a normal people. Again, yeah, pretty powerful. Um, you know, two points I want to make. You know, the last thing that he said, it makes it easier for everybody, not just him. Technology, you know, is not, doesn't just help people with disabilities, it helps everybody. And the second thing, Second thing, sorry, is that um, Vietnam wheelchair costs eight hundred dollars, and that's an annual income for an individual. So there's no way they can afford any of this technology. So that's why it's important for uh, non-governmental organizations to help out with medical and, and uh, different kinds of technology. Uh, Okay. Yeah, the um, um, one thing at, uh, at work is that there's a, a AT for All is a database. It's a free online service that lists, uh, and, lists and find equipment in Nebraska. So it's, um, you can um, borrow and locate uh, any kind of technology. There's about 11,600 devices on this database, atforall.com. Uh, there's all kinds of equipment for any kind of disability. So there's, there's equipment on there for, for uh, individuals that are blind, individuals that are deaf or hard of hearing, uh, any kind of mobility equipment. It's like a, it's like a Craigslist. And you, and you can uh, borrow equipment for 30 days. Um, and this is, uh, this is uh, kind of a comic, the A2 for all, that you know, we just throw away equipment, but here, you know, we reuse, we rethink, we recycle, and we repair technology. It's very important that, that we do that. Um, demo center. We have a fairly large demo center where people can come in and try out technology, uh, all different kinds of technology. Um, we also can uh, come, if, if you're not a partnering agency, we can also do a fee-for-service where we can come out to an employment setting and do assessments uh, for a small fee, give recommendations on uh, different kinds of accommodations. And um, someone put this cartoon on my, on my cubicle, my door is always open, just don't come in. This is kind of a reminder to me that I, I really want you to call. If you have a need, uh, you know, don't, don't 
call us, but I mean, I mean call us, but don't ignore the uh, comic. It was just a reminder to talk about that. So um, I really, I'm very honored to be able to speak with you today and to co-present with uh, uh, Michael Hingson, and I, I really appreciate it. If there's any questions. Why it's it's it varies. Um, you can you can um, access our services through what's called a service and device application. It's a multi-agency form. Uh, what that does is it triggers um, someone to come out there. Now, depending on if there's a funding source that's always attached to that, you know who's going to pay for the recommendations that that we offer, um, and and that's what we also try to do is is have. A funding source lined up. So uh, at various times during the year, uh, Part B monies, which is for independent living, those become available. Um, but it, it just depends. I can't really give a, a definite, you know, it'll take a month, but usually we'll have somebody, assistive uh, technology specialist, uh, call within, within uh, uh, possibly a month after the application, or it, it just depends uh, what the need is. Well, the workplace, um, if you're affiliated, uh, if, if, you're, if, they happen to, if the individual happens to be a voc rehab client, um, they're a partner, partnering agency. So they actually pay for our services as well as health and human services. They contract with us to come out and do assessments. And that usually takes about, uh, depending if it's a priority situation, we can get out there in five days. If it's not, we usually can get out there in, within 30 days. They call the individual within um, within a week. Okay. Is that all? Okay. I, I brought one other thing to show you, just real quick. These are um, these are made in Nebraska. These are called descalators or razets. I think the new name is razets. So you can put them underneath your your workstation. It's a very inexpensive way to raise your workstation if you have to. And you can stack these up. I think you can stack them up to about three or four inches to raise your workstation. And this other device I brought, it's, uh, it's called a handy bar. And for somebody that has trouble getting out of their vehicle, you can put this in, uh, you open the door, and there's a little latching mechanism on the, on the uh, A pillar of the car. And you just put this in there, and you have a little handle that you can help raise yourself up out of the seat. So these can be useful for some, some individuals. So there's just so much technology out there um, uh, available these days and it's changed over the last 20 years even. Uh, there's so much available to help people now. So well thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.